So apparently we're halfway between Calimera and Calispera. So uh, I'm going with Calimera because I haven't eaten lunch yet. Um, thank you for coming. I'm David Lockie, founder of Pragmatic. We're a 50-person digital agency based in Brighton in the UK. Uh, you might know the UK, the one that's just about still in Europe. Um, we specialize in WordPress and we work strategically with our clients to build digital platforms with WordPress as a key component that create value long term. Um, today, I want to talk to you about a case study that, uh, for a project that we've been running all year for a company called PEI Media. So this uh, case study really starts with a conversation, um, uh, a cup of coffee with uh, a, new, a new person that started to work at the client. Uh, we're in the middle of London, so I want you to imagine glass and steel and concrete. This is the financial heart of London. Um, and we're, I'm meeting this guy for the first time, although I've worked with the business for, um, for a few years. So let me introduce you to the client. The client is PEI Media. They're um, a financial media group um, with offices all around the world. And they produce editorial content, so written um, words. They do data. Um, they put it on events. And they advertise. So they offer an uh, advertising platform for people in this sector. And the sector is uh, private equity, specifically alternative asset classes of private equity. So um, this is sort of big finance. Uh, they have um, a number of different brands. So I think they had about 10, and we've consolidated that down to eight. And they typically sell to, um, so it'll be investors, institutional investors, research, uh, research analysts, etc. And they, uh, around these different brands, they produce uh, physical magazines, they produce digital um, products, and usually they have an event as well. Um, and email marketing is also particularly important for them. Um, there are important things that happen in the industry, and people want to get notified uh, as quickly as possible because it affects the market. So sending out emails um, with alerts and updates, as well as regular newsletters, is, is super important. So this is um, to set a, a bit more context about this program. It's not just about building a website. Um, it's a much wider remit. Um, the company's just been through a round of investment. And this new guy that I'm talking to has a remit to do this program of work. So uh, to transform the whole business, um, not just build a website, but change the structure, um, consolidate around a new vision for what the business is going to be in five years uh, and make, make a plan to get there. Um, they want to achieve significant growth. They've just had a round of investment. And of course, what investors want is um, their money back with some more money on top. So to do that, we have to achieve growth. Um, so making sure that uh, we take their current business, which incidentally is already doing very well. So publishing is often sort of seen as quite a, an industry that's in trouble because it's hard to monetize. And uh, if you're in the business of producing magazines, everything's online. Publishers seem to be in trouble a lot of the time. Uh, this company isn't. They've been growing super fast anyway. So a key job for us is, is not, to, not to screw it up um, and then deliver growth on top. The premium products piece is worth noting as well. Um, their clients are some of the most um, wealthy, influential people around the planet. These are the folks that have their own private jets. Um, so if we produce a product that looks like it's cheap and tacky, they're going to lose market share to their competitors. And the final part of this is that right at the start of the program, um, my key contact's vision was very much the same as ours, which is that there are, there's really a kind of polarization now in enterprise software. Either you go with a typical enterprise uh, software product, so Adobe or Salesforce or Sitecore, one of these kind of huge 
big um, piece of software that can do everything and then you learn how to configure and drive it better than your competitors and that's a really valid strategy for a lot of businesses. But there's another way and that other way is to uh, design and build your own digital infrastructure as part of your business. So you have to embed that digital capability, the knowledge, the know-how within your business so that you can start with a business requirement, um, identify the, uh, the, the technical requirements that are needed to solve that business requirement, go and find a solution and then work out how to integrate it with the rest of your digital systems. And obviously that is where uh, WordPress and open source software can really come in because it's cheap, fast, um, highly scalable. So what I want to do is walk through the technical design of how we sort of implemented this new platform. Um, and I'll look at the kind of technical architecture, but also the, like the, the business requirements that stood behind that and what the end result is. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the operational design. So how do we actually work with the client to, to get this program done? So this is, what we, this is what we think of as WordPress, right? You have a content management system and you publish a page and that's what most people use WordPress for. I'm going to add a bit of structure here. Um, because this is the way that bigger businesses think about their digital estate. So they think about it as uh, systems of record or data, and this is stuff like finance and um, inventory research data, stuff that, um, stuff that is core to the business and adds strategic value, and it's powered by big platforms, CRMs, ERPs, um, custom databases that you don't want to change out very often. Then at the far end of the scale, you've got the experiences. So these are the, um, the web apps or the mobile apps or the web pages or the email or the social content, all of the different touch points that both people and machines can use to interact with your organization. And um, those do change quickly, right? We've all seen, you can, you can tell when a website is more than a few years old because it looks dated, it's not responsive, it's slow, etc. In the middle, we've got this kind of this layer called architecture, um, which is what we use to connect those two systems together with. Um, and these systems are things like WordPress and email management providers that change on maybe a sort of two, three, four year kind of cycle rather than every year, every month, or every 10 years. And even this basic implementation of WordPress is a content management system is a front end was a significant advantage on what they had before. They had uh, enterprise software and it was pretty awful. Um, even to correct a spelling mistake for many years, they had to republish the entire site. So thousands of articles, that was an overnight job. So if you made a spelling mistake in an article as a journalist, and bear in mind they're publishing tens of articles every day, if you made a spelling mistake, it would be there for the world to see for 24 hours until the site was republished. So it's a classic example of enterprise software that's feature rich, but actually falls down for simple day-to-day -day tasks. So we're already winning with WordPress, which is what we do. So we're now gonna add in um, WooCommerce to power some e-commerce. Now, um, again, straightforward. We've got a content management system where we can add uh, like a picture of the product. We can add some content about it. We can add a price and it displays out to the front end. Um, and that's powerful because it means that uh, like one set of training will serve both the people that need to publish articles and create products, and they'll both look the same on the front end as well. So all pretty straightforward so far. Um, and then we go and do something different and a bit crazy. So we stick this um, platform called Blaze in front of WordPress. And so all of the web pages are now served through Blaze. Blaze is, um, it's not a, a product that Pragmatic have built. It's um, a, a SaaS that is provided by uh, a technical partner in this program. And it does basically three things. One is that it caches all of WordPress's um, output. The second is that it has the ability to swap parts of the pages 
um, on the fly. And the third is that it provides an API that has uh, users' details in. So what Blaze is all about is um, identity management and access control. So if you want to sell access to your content rather than providing it for free, you could use a system like Blaze to do that. So here, just by putting Blaze in front of WordPress, we can go from here's all the content on the web page to you must now register um, and and or sign up, uh, sign in to see the content. So that, that content is now restricted. Um, another cool thing that Blaze does is uh, like you use Slack here in Greece, right? I think everyone uses Slack now. Slack has this uh, neat kind of magic link um, feature where instead of having to remember your password, you put your email in, it sends you a link, you click it and you're logged into the, um, to the app. And uh, Blaze lets us do the same thing. Um, so remember here, we're not actually registering or signing in with WordPress at all. WordPress doesn't know anything about who's looking at these pages. All of that uh, identity management is done by Blaze. So users can put in their email, they can click um, sign in, go to the, their inbox on that device, click the link and they'll be logged in. Um, which is actually quite powerful in terms of making sure that people aren't sharing usernames and passwords. So something that uh, might have happened previously is that a company would pay for one subscription and then they'd post the username and password on the company intranet and everyone could use it. Here, the only way of accessing the content is to click uh, a link that's gone to, the, to your email app on the same device. So you have to authorize per device and that makes it a lot harder for people to, to share, right? You're not gonna share your email, you like email password, right? So um, there's lots of things that we can now do just by this simple change in architecture. Let's have a look at um, Google. So one of people's experiences with your brand is for a search engine. People go looking for content, they see a result from uh, a website that you own and then they decide whether or not to click through. Um, so if you work with digital publishing, you might know that for paid or restricted content, there's this idea of first click free. So if you want your content to be ranked by Google in its search engine, you have to let somebody click through and see that first article for free. And after that, you can restrict it through registration walls or paywalls or do whatever you want. So that, um, that analysis of where has a user come from? Is it a search engine? Have they viewed other articles on this site within the last 30 days or not? Um, that decision engine is powered by Blaze and it'll either serve you the content or it'll put a registration wall up. So um, if you remember at the beginning, I said that uh, PEI do four things. They do editorial content, they do research and analytics data, they do events and they do advertising. Research and analytics is really important. Who's invested in which fund? How full is it? What investments has that fund made? What's the performance of it? Who works at which firm? Which firms commonly collaborate on funds? What are their interests? All of this is really powerful information for their customers because it lets the um, market know what's happening. But their data lives in a custom Microsoft SQL database in a totally different VPS. So how on earth can we expose that onto a WordPress site to give them this feeling of an integrated product. Um, and the way that that was done was by throwing all of the RNA database um, through Elasticsearch. So there's a, a process that just dumps the data into Elasticsearch every night. Um, and we then built a, a React app that sits on the front of WordPress and ingests that data from Elasticsearch's API. So we've now got this website that has uh, editorial content from the WordPress CMS, but also uh, rich tabulated um, data from the RNA database as well. So we can do things, for example, like dropping a, a graph with live interactive data into the middle of, you know, here's a text block, here's an image, here's a, here's a video. So it starts to become a very slick and powerful platform for PEI's customers to find out what's going on because they can read a story and then they can explore some of the data that sits behind that. For PEI, this data is um, only available to higher tiered subscribers as well, certainly not to free ones, not even to the, the kind of lower tier of paid. So it's really important that we can drive 
lots of exposure and awareness of this data to encourage people to subscribe at the highest tier. Cool. So this is what the um, platform looks like at the moment. WordPress and WooCommerce are still sitting right in the middle of everything, but we've started to augment what WordPress could ever hope to do on its own um, without writing a heck of a lot of PHP that would probably run really slowly and be awful. So now we are going to add in CRM. So this is one of those systems of record. And again, this is uh, a hosted service. It's hosted by a different infrastructure provider. The technology um, doesn't really, there's no kind of off the shelf integrations to, to pump that into WordPress. So we need to connect it through Blaze to handle uh, when people buy a new account online. The, the customer services team need to know that. Likewise, if somebody takes a, a, a call over the phone, buys a new subscription, then they want to get their, their access rights on the website as soon as possible. And this plays out particularly with um, WooCommerce, right? So with WooCommerce, the way that um, that usually works is that you register with WooCommerce and then WordPress knows your uh, details. And when you go to like a, a checkout page, it's pre-filled some of the these rows with the information that WordPress knows about you because WordPress and WooCommerce share that data. Now here, because people aren't registering or logging in at all with WordPress, um, WooCommerce is basically stateless. It doesn't know who you are. All it's doing is presenting a checkout page um, to an, an anonymous user. Um, so here, one of those components of Blaze, which is the API, comes into play. And when somebody hits checkout and we know information about them, we can pull that information from Blaze via the API and inject it into the WooCommerce checkout. So as far as WooCommerce is concerned, this is a guest checking out. But the only way that you can land there is if you're logged in through Blaze already. And so you, you hit this kind of integrated, seamless experience with the data coming from different points. Um, and I'll illustrate how that works a little bit more closely in a minute. Um, but basically what this gives the business is the ability for any subscriber that has bought a subscription online or over the phone um, to get their, their entitlement straight away and for the customer services team to be able to support that, um, that customer straight away, straight away as well. So this saves a lot of time for both the sales team and for the customer services team. So, analytics. Analytics are super important for a business. Um, they show them what the opportunities are for improving the return on the investment. Obviously, doing all this stuff costs quite a lot of money. They want to see business value back, and we do that by providing rich analytics that feed into business goals and um, key results. So in this case, we use uh, Google's Tag Manager product to feed data back to, amongst other things, Google Analytics, and then back from there through to business intelligence platforms. Um, so let's go back to that checkout page and figure out what the data is that we're going to be sending back. OK, so on the left-hand screenshot, we've got um, pointer. Here we have uh, color coded the different components of the page. And here is the uh, Google Tag Manager data layer. Have, have many people come across a data layer like a GTM data layer? Can I get a show of hands so I know? Yeah? Cool, thank you. All right, so if you think about Google Tag Manager and a data layer as sort of Google Analytics on steroids, it means that you can customize exactly what data you want to pass back to other analytics platforms and you can construct these kind of much richer data models. So in this case, we've color coded it. Um, the WordPress part of the data layer matches the page. So WordPress produces a, a page um, that, uh, that hosts the WooCommerce checkout and it says things here like, here's the um, Google Analytics account for this page. Here are the, um, here's the URL, here's the name of the thing, uh, the page. Uh, here's the time that it was accessed, etc. Then we've got WooCommerce, which um, provides a basket. So in the basket are products that have got prices in different currencies for different, um, you know, and the user is at a particular stage of the checkout journey. 
and then in Amber we've um, we've got the user's data which has come from Blaze. So up here it says this is the user's ID, uh, this is how many pages they've seen, etc. So this whole combined data layer then gets extracted from you know these two or three different systems and presented back to the the business intelligence platforms, which lets us do some really interesting stuff. It gives us much more control about the data we can send back and therefore the models that we can do. And there's some really interesting um, services around there for things like propensity modeling and big data for publishers. So if you have a bunch of subscribers, it's really vital that you know roughly how many are gonna resubscribe without any extra effort because they're using the, the service every day. Um, and those that haven't used the service for a couple of months and might need a sales call, right? So it's about efficiency of the marketing and sales team, and that leads to things like marketing automation and better business uh, projections. So you'll be glad to know there's not much room for many more components on here, um, but I'm gonna talk about the email marketing part of it, which is vital to their business model, and you can see now that we've got this kind of very rich set of data flows around the architecture. At its simplest, you can think of it as a kind of virtuous cycle. So the job of the architecture is to expose enough of these bits of data at the front end to personalize and optimize the experience for that particular user at that particular time uh, and encourage them to take an action which adds value back to them and the business. The data then from here flows back into these systems of record here um, and add to the strategic value of the business. So around all these connections, the aim is to make it go like that. Um, and although it looks complex, actually a platform like this gives us some real power. So for a premium content business like PEI, they have one click for free, and then you can register and you can get three articles for, for free because you've given sort of your, they know who you are now, and that's worth money to them. Um, the next step is if you try and visit a, a fourth article, you hit like a paywall. You now have to pay for a, a, a subscription because you're using their content um, enough. So it's critical that on a tactical level, we encourage people to click through and read another article as often as possible. You know, if we can encourage 20% more people to click on the fourth article every month, we'll actually drive signifi significant revenue. And so we end up looking at related articles, which are kind of the, the typical way that people go through from one article to another. And it becomes clear that it's worth investing some time and effort to make sure that these articles down here are not articles that a user's already looked at this month, that they're gonna be relevant. And um, the architecture that we've built can do that. We know um, enough about the user from Blaze. We know which articles they've looked at, what um, tags and categories, they seem to be interested in. Um, and we have a, a content API, again, from Elasticsearch, which means that we can mash those two things up and use a React app to, to kind of uh, display the most specifically relevant next stories for that particular user. So we, we're giving that, giving that user the most interesting possible stories and the business the best possible chance of presenting users with a paywall. Cool, so that's the architecture. Um, there's actually quite a lot more that goes on as well. Um, and we've built very similar architectures with other clients as well. So this isn't something that's sort of dreamt up. This is kind of a proven model for how you use WordPress in the middle to bolt on a whole bunch of different components and interfaces and then model out the workflows that are gonna add value to a, to a business. So, how do we do this? How do we get from a conversation through to, you know, a year later, thousands of man hours, like a functional platform like that? Um, so we did this with um, Agile, so a Scrum team, uh, and in fact the the other technical partners were working on Scrums as well. Last time I gave this talk, all the questions that I got about it, they're nothing to do with the technical architecture, it was all about how on earth did you manage to sell Scrum into a client? Um, so I guess I'll talk a little bit about that now. The client knew that they wanted to use agile uh, methodologies to deliver this. It's, it's like a, a large backlog, it's complex, 
they know that they don't know all the details, and so they were prepared to, within reason, um, use high-level estimates to work out how much time, how much money it would take to do different things and evaluate their options, and then run a, a nice um, scrum process to make progress. So um, we had to align very early on on what the end state of that vision was. We had to do some discovery time to work out what all of the, the kind of high-level ethics were and to do that estimating so that we could then start, um, start running as a scrum team. Um, to start with, it was, it was a bit of a leap of faith for a client. Um, it always is with Agile because what you're promising is to make progress against these stories to the best of your ability. But um, as the client sees delivery coming in, they, you build that trust and they, they give you a little bit more uh, room to maneuver, a, a bit more trust, a bit more budget, and you can carry on and ramp up. So it's really important early on to deliver value back to the business and to do it in a visible way and in a way that is communicated widely within the business as well. So from that basis of trust, then we can kind of ramp up to a good, good working speed and eventually everyone starts thinking about stories and points and which sprint this is going to get delivered and it's really quite powerful to see that kind of digital transformation happening. Now, of course, to do that, um, if you're coming from an organization that's quite traditional and you've got managers and you've got um, kind of hierarchies that don't necessarily align with what the business does um, and how this new kind of integrated vision for the business needs to work, there's a certain amount of um, kind of coaching, nurturing, teaching new skills. So um, learning what it means to be a product owner or what an acceptance criteria is um, bringing in external expertise, business consultants, um, scrum masters on both sides. We did this, the client did that. Um, it's, it c you can't expect the same people to come into work the next day and do something totally different than they've done before. You need to inject some, um, some training, some know-how, some expertise into that. Um, really worth doing. Um, in terms of working with stakeholders, a typical project kind of works like this. When we or it, well, it always has. When we were smaller, you would have quite a few meetings at the start. You would agree what the project was, and then you'd kind of wave goodbye and maybe see them in a month or two months when you've built the thing and hope, hope they like it. Um, this was very different. This was weekly meetings um, and sort of very intensive meetings every two weeks as well, so proper sprint planning, retrospective, very open, honest conversations. Well, this isn't exactly what we intended. Okay, but that's what the ticket says. We interpret it like this. And so together you kind of understand how how not to make the same mistake with your communication or with the um, with assumptions next time. Uh, and after a few sprints, you, you really do clear that stuff out. Um, and it's resulted in fantastic delivery. So what all of this has to be about is not writing code, not doing clever architecture. It's about how do we deliver value back to the business. So that ideally, they'll want to keep spending money with us because they can see that uh, we can keep adding value back. We can help them with that delivery, but we can also help them understand what else is out there in the industry and how they might be able to profit from it as well. So more and more, I think the, the role of digital agencies is to be that interface between kind of business over here, which is getting on with being their business, and the cutting edge of technology over here, um, and, and trying to close that gap where it seems like a good fit. And so that kind of ongoing uh, inspiration, ideation, um, creating a backlog that you can then work on, it's, it's really powerful synergy. So what did, what did all this end up with? Um, I w want to talk through like a program status report, which is maybe a kind of controversial um, thing to do. Typically not that exciting, but really important to think about how when you're working with these kind of longer term programs, you're actually talking back to the people in the business and not just your immediate stakeholders, but the people that they report to. So how do we make this program a kind of a success, not just with the output, but with the kind of the propaganda and the, the PR campaign internally. And these status reports have, um, are one of the ways that we've done that. 
so it's a really long page, basically. There's quite a lot in it, um, broken down, um, and I'm just going to like pull a few key sections out and say why I think they're important and interesting. So at the top, we've got like this high-level roadmap. So there are different work streams. There are different uh, projects happening within those work streams, and those little red dots there, uh, triangles, are milestones. So these are the dates that we know uh, have a business impact. Um, you know, they need to do lots of testing for a site to go live, or they need to be prepared to do a content freeze, or they've got an event coming up or something like that. Uh, but it gives the business a really nice overview of what's been done and what's coming up. Uh, next, we've got this sort of overall program status. So these are high-level questions at the top. I've blurred it out because obviously it's kind of like a live program. Um, but these questions say things like, are we delivering to schedule? Are we delivering to cost? Is the quality good enough? Have we got enough time for resource? So they're kind of plain English, open, honest questions to which the business expects clear, open, honest answers back, not, well, it's kind of okay, but blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, you know yes, we're doing okay, and it's, uh, uh, and it's looking like it's going to be okay, or actually, no, we're in a bit of trouble. We need some more resource because we've got all these requirements coming in, and we can't, uh, we can't write them into stories quickly enough for the team to run through them. Um, then, if you if you work Scrum, the you'll recognise the one on the left is like a, a burn down chart. So actually, it's a, a bit of an embarrassing one to show. The the grey line is uh, over a two week period. That shows how many points you would um, burn. So on the left, you start with 40 points, and every time you complete a, a story or a task, you complete that story. So you burn the point. And that's the kind of the terminology behind it. And so the, the flat bit in the middle is the weekend. We don't work over the weekend unless there's a uh, crisis. Um, so in an ideal way, the red line, which is the actual burn down, would follow that gray line there. Now, obviously, we've left things a little bit to the last minute on this sprint. Perhaps there's uh, valid reasons for that, but um, it kind of then it falls off a cliff. But our aim always is that the red line and the gray line meet at the bottom. Anyway. Um, here are some other charts as well. Um, these show things like quality of stories um, in the backlog and the progress through all of the uh, stories for a particular release. And these charts and the ones before come straight out of JIRA. So if you um, have used JIRA, it's, it's a super powerful piece of software. And this, um, this page is generated in confluence. So the two link together. One's like a wiki, one's like a uh, software development tool. They're really quite complex to get your head around if you're used to like Basecamp or Asana or uh, a piece of paper. But when you invest in putting the data in and using the tools properly, the reporting that you can get back out is um, crazy powerful. Um, this one I really like as well. I'll talk through. So basically, these are um, this is like a financial model that sits behind everything. So. Every time we agree to do a sprint, like a two-week chunk of work, we agree um, which bits of work they're going to be, so which stories are coming into that sprint, and those stories all have um, like a value, a nominal value, which we call points. So we know that if we've got four or five people working full-time on a sprint for two weeks, we should be able to burn 40 points. Um, and what this, these graphs do is they track what is the actual cost per sprint. So we timesheet everything, and at the end of the week, if we've only done 20 points, then um, it's going to look like the value per point is going way down. If we've done 50 points, the value per point is going up. And so this is a way for the business to make sure that they're getting delivery, but we're also staying kind of uh, at, a, at a constant rate of how much that delivery costs. And over weeks and months and years, that becomes super important, right? Because it avoids conversations like, well, I don't think you guys are working as hard on this as you used to. Or um, the client, in turn, trying to introduce like bigger stories and pass them off as this is only one point when you know it's really a two. So it's a really good check and a balance. Uh, and at the bottom here is like a high-level risk register. So what are the things which could still go wrong, which could impact this program, um, mean that we don't hit our delivery dates or costs or quality? Um, and just a quick bit of 
quick look at the results and then um, let's do some Q&A. So we've now completed the migration actually. Um, it's been a pretty crazy year that says, like we started running on this um, in January and we completed the migrations, I think uh, about a month ago. And the business has kind of reformed around this whole idea of delivery. So they now have new roles, they have people who are subject matter experts, they pass stories into backlogs, they all vote on them. Um, and this idea of the business product, this kind of uh, the digital product kind of has a seat at the highest table in the business. It's no longer like uh, it's the editorial team and we've got a website. It's like, what is this product? How does it impact our customers? How is it adding value? Um, so it's a, a real realignment. Um, they now have faith in digital again. Having used some really awful software before, they were pretty skeptical, cynical about digital projects. Um, that's gone away. Um, and we've got, through, do, through doing things like this uh, passwordless um, authentication, they've now got a much clearer and more honest view of who's actually using their service, you know, how many users in this organization are using this username and login. Uh, so yeah, we've migrated all eight sites across. Um, there were 10, a couple of them being consolidated or ditched. So um, yeah, eight sites and a platform build in a year feels like quite good work. Um, and the business results are, are pretty clear as well. So uh, total traffic's gone up nearly a quarter, organic uh, above that average. Um, and mobile traffic in particular has increased. Um, so in fact, this site was on WordPress already. Um, so the difference is slightly less than on this site, which was on this kind of legacy architecture. Um, and, and you know, the overall traffic is much higher there. Uh, I'm a bit over time, so uh, I'll just pick a couple of these out. Um, like the transitions between different bits of a program uh, are the most difficult and the most risky. So that how do you get from that conversation and the initial meetings to the first bit of paid work, like a discovery thing? That whole piece takes a, a heck of a lot of effort and care to make sure it happens. And likewise, once you've finished discovery, um, transitioning from there to, well, we think this is what's involved and how much it's gonna cost can we have the money to do it now, please? That's also a really critical period and it's a very, it's time intensive and also quite emotionally intensive as well. So once you've done that with a bigger program and you can kind of earn that trust and you, you reach momentum, but building the momentum is really difficult and I'd really encourage you to invest like personally in the relationships that you have with the stakeholders at that, those points. Spend time outside of meetings spend time outside of that, that you have to spend with them, you know. Often, I mean, one of the things I've always loved most about running a digital agency is meeting people, right? People often are like, oh, clients this and clients that. I won't have it um, in pragmatic. Our clients are, uh, A, the people that pay our wages, but B, some of the most clever, um, inspiring people that you'll meet. You know, they've done well enough with their business that they can afford us, um, to build them a website, we should be very respectful of that. If they don't know stuff about how digital works, that's our fault, not theirs. So um, get to know these people. You know, they're running successful businesses. They can help you as well. Um, this kind of whole uh, stack of tools that we, was pretty painful to invest in. I mean, I spent a lot of kind of 2 a.m. mornings building backlogs in Jira and reassigning things into different releases and components, but the reporting that we now get out of it is like super slick. And the same with things like um, continuous integration. So it's a bit of a faff to set up, um, but once you get to the point where all your code has to be pull requested and reviewed, and as soon as it gets accepted into a branch, it triggers a whole bunch of build and test processes and ends up on a, a staging server for the client to review, it saves so much time and hassle going forward. So it makes you look like a much slicker, well you are a much slicker uh, operation. Yeah, questions then, I guess. Thank you.
What do you think is the, the role of WordPress in the architecture that you followed? I mean, how, how big the role of WordPress actually is? Could it have been done with any other CMS? That's a great question, Takis. It definitely could have been done with other CMSs. Um, so our initial kind of involvement was responding to a, uh, an RFP, like a request for um, proposals, yeah. And we had to score WordPress against a whole bunch of general content management requirements. I think, um, I think we were the only open source solution there. There were some other ones, like proprietary ones. I mean, one could have done the same thing with Drupal, probably, um, probably with some other open source CMSs as well. Yeah. Parts of uh, thank you <laughs> of WordPress, like the REST API of, or WooCommerce as well. Yeah. So um, not so much in this program. Yeah. Although um, we've. We've done quite a lot of, I don't think we did it in this case, I think we did it with um, sort of database level migration, but we've definitely used the REST API for content migrations in different programs, so scraping sites and injecting it through the REST API, that's been really interesting. Um, so back, back in the um, architecture, we saw this sort of split of um, WordPress here in the middle. Um, Oh, it's gone. WordPress in the middle and then the front end website on the right hand side. Now, I if that was going to be kind of a true separation of concerns, we wouldn't be using a WordPress theme, right? We'd be using WordPress as a headless API and we'd build out a, like a, a custom front end that was totally standalone so that the business can swap out the CMS for a different one. And that's kind of the, the benefit and the idea behind this kind of architecture, right? Is um, WordPress might not always be the best content management system. So from a kind of responsibility point of view, we want to design an architecture that if the business's requirements change, they can swap it out for a different one. Same with the <coughs> front end, same with identity management. So a business needs to be able to swap some stuff out faster than other stuff for lots of different reasons. And that's one of the things that becomes super difficult to do if you've got like a big monolithic piece of enterprise software. You kind of, you have to do all or nothing a lot of the time, or it's very expensive bespoke development, which then kind of takes away the value of using something which does everything in the first place. Okay. Hi. Uh, well, I would like to ask uh, a bit, if possible, to elaborate uh, on uh, why did you need uh, why you needed uh, Agile for this project because. Uh, uh, was it, uh, it? It was a project that it's uh, one-off, right? Like, uh, I mean, why did you need the different sprints for that? After the first uh, sprint, uh, you delivered the product that uh, the t the the company was using, Good. but it didn't have CRM, for example, or it Good. didn't Good have question. email, right? So we used Agile um, for a bunch of reasons. One was, um, this has been quite a long project, so we've done, I think, 25, 26 sprints this year. Um, and that gives us 25 or 26 opportunities to reprioritize, um, review what's in the backlog and make the best possible decisions. It's hard to know where the business is gonna be in six months or nine months, let alone what the kind of most pressing requirements are gonna be. Um, we knew that there was quite a lot of uncertainty. Some of the components in here hadn't been finalized. Um, in fact, some still aren't finalized. Uh, so it gave us the flexibility to head towards a vision without having to have defined every detail about it. Um, and obviously this is quite a big project. And so the, the, the other alternative is to do kind of a waterfall type approach. But to do that relies much more on um, knowing knowing more at the start. Here, we knew that we were going to answer a bunch of questions along the way. Um, also, it's worth noting that we could do Agile on this because fundamentally we're building a software product. You know, the platform that underpins these brands is a product and they can onboard new brands and new, new websites. But a typical website 
project for you know most freelancers or small businesses like you know five thousand euros or something there's no point doing sprints for that you can take a lot of agile methodology into your approach but you know that that is a sprint or it's two sprints so you don't get the benefit of the kind of continuous cycles of sprint and optimization that um, a longer program does does that kind of answer cool thanks uh hello um Thanks very much for the great presentation. Congratulations. And I had a, a question. Uh, since you're integrating uh, a couple of systems with uh, WordPress and WooCommerce, this should uh, bring to you um, some sort of um, high level of support you need to do when things are changing to the solutions that you're integrating, one. And second, uh, how, how if there's a process that you do to uh, stay up to date with those changes in those systems, so that your solution could be always up to date to the changes of WordPress and the other solutions as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the first question was, how do we support that when the, there are so many integrations, right? Because the whole platform depends on multiple different pieces of software from multiple parties. Um, that's something we're still working on, actually. We've got, at the moment, we have... Um, multiple support desks from multiple um, providers and you know we pass tickets around if you know if their business opens the ticket in the wrong service desk um, at some point we're, we're going to want to put in uh, sort of 360 support service desk so everyone just comes uh, comes to us or another provider first and they follow a triage sort of decision tree and farm the tickets out uh, to the to the other suppliers um, one thing that we have done is have you ever seen like status page it's a sort of it's a platform where you can put front and back end testing into one big page so that's a really useful way of diagnosing so here we can tell whether staging and live for all the different brands is up at lots of different levels so is the database up is the web server up is blaze up etc um so that's the first one how do you support a stack like that um and the second one is how do we stay up to date with all the changes? And I think, you know, we go back to Agile there as well, which is that the business understands that this is open source software. There are going to be updates. So um, same question kind of applies to tech debt as well. Sometimes we'll decide to do something quick and dirty for the sake of hitting a business deadline, but we'll put it on a tech debt list and it sort of at a reasonable pace, we'll ask to draw down some points from the tech debt tech debt and or maintenance and or kind of any other like you know technical improvements um, and so whether that's somebody doing some research us doing some testing it, it they can all be pointed bits of work um, in our experience it's better to do little and often with that because it's much easier for the business to explain why uh, five points out of 40 have to be kind of uh, tech debt reduction and maintenance points rather than just feature delivery than to say at the end of the year, oh, now here's a big bill to do tech debt and maintenance. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So being open and honest and making sure the client understands from the start that running their own platform means taking responsibility for those, those aspects of doing it as well. Yeah. One, one more. Hi, David. Thank you for uh, your questions. Yeah. Hi, David. This is Ciprian from Apticals. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks. Um, have you felt moments when you were micromanaging, especially with those weekly meetings with the stakeholders? And how can you get the stakeholders to a monthly meeting, for example? That's a good question. So um, it's about sort of stakeholder involvement. Um, I firmly believe that the regularity of the meetings is key to the success. And actually, if they, if the client wanted to go back to monthly meetings, I'd start getting really nervous. Um, now, I hasten to add, this isn't necessarily me directly being in the meetings. You know, we have a team, and the team are in multiple meetings with the client every week. Um, it's not micromanaging; it's about communication. So, one of the uh, most important parts of the Agile manifesto is communication over 
documentation, right? So you have to keep talking, you have to build that relationship and you have to create the space for conversations to happen because often everyone's very busy and unless you are sitting there with an agenda to run through this stuff, it won't be deemed important until actually it's really critical. So um, by no means um, <coughs> should these be free. These are part of like running a successful project, right? You charge for project management, you charge for QA, so you should charge for this meeting time as well. Um, so it's a valuable component of what you are delivering as an agency. You know, you're not, if you're charging just to write lines of code, that's a, it's a kind of a broken model, right? If you're paying to offer strategy, advice, help, plan, as well as deliver the work, then it's a far kind of broader relationship. Is that all right? Okay, cool. Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, as I recall from your uh, diagram, uh, then uh, the RNA data bucket was connected to the Elasticsearch, and the Elasticsearch provides data to the WordPress. Uh, to, to a React app that is embedded within WordPress. Sorry again? To, to a React app that's embedded with yeah. WordPress, yeah. But yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Elasticsearch uh, creates agnostic directories and lexicons. So how did you manage to get the Elasticsearch to concentrate on data and export um, data and values that are um, that can be used to, to show diagrams and data that are um, that that um, that's, it has a content value that people want to read. So, let me just check. I'm answering the right question. So, the question is, Elasticsearch is kind of an un, like it takes a kind of data lake approach, and you pull out what you want. Yeah, uh, uh, as I know, uh, from my knowledge, uh, Elasticsearch is, is agnostic. So the results, we don't know the results. So how did you uh, manage to filter out, to prune the, uh, uh, the unnecessary data? That's a pretty detailed technical question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I might, I might phone, phone well, a friend. I, I was dying one. to ask you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So look, I'll be around all day. So um, let's talk about that one in a bit more detail. Thanks for, thanks for coming, everyone.